I'm Pablo, and you are watching The 161 Report, streaming to you live from Bamboo Strategic Media. The 161 Report is a platform created to bring entrepreneurs, industry experts, and achieved uh, and accomplished entrepreneurs to help educate them and help them along their journeys. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, his name is Jeff Hoffman, and he's extremely accomplished. He's a global entrepreneur from Priceline, UBID, and a number of other ventures, serial entrepreneur. Not only that, but he's also produced an album that won a Grammy, and he's even gotten into film. This man is truly incredible, and we are so fortunate to be with him today in the studio. So Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me today. So Jeff, um, why don't we get started by having you share just briefly about your story and how you got started. Started as an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, sure. So, um, you know, I, I actually, I'll tell you what, my very first experience, I was, uh, you know, had a single mother uh, that would work three jobs or whatever she had to do to try to make ends meet. So I was very entrepreneurial always, mowing a lawn, cleaning a pool, running an errand, selling something door to door, uh, just to take the pressure off my mom so I didn't have to ask for money. Um, so I had that, that attitude, that mindset a little bit anyway, but my first real entrepreneurial venture was that Pablo, I wanted to go to a college I couldn't afford. Um, and I wanted to go specifically to Yale and we could not afford to go to a school like Yale University, but I got in. And when I got there, I got basically kicked out because I hadn't paid, which is fair enough to the university. They wouldn't let me go to class, but I didn't want to go home. So I started, I thought I got to find a way to, to solve this problem, to come up with the funds. So I started a little software company the first week of college that couldn't go to class. And I wound up running a company all four years and funding my entire education and graduating in fourth years. So that in four years. So that the relationship between starting a business to make some money to to uh, to get to achieve some goal. I learned that starting when I was a college student uh, and was able to successfully achieve that. And. I mean, was there lessons along the way? Was it easy? It, it sounds like, you know, you were just like first week in college. Most people first week in college have no idea what to do when, if it comes to starting a business. So how was that process? Well, I didn't either. And I have to tell you that I picked software. Running a software company would have been a good idea, except that I don't know how to write software because they won't let me go to class. So I haven't learned anything yet. But I thought software has good margins. It's a good biz. So I, I went to like a FedEx Kinko's kind of store and I created letterhead for a company and I spent $15 online to register so I'd be a legal company. No idea what I'm doing. Now I have a name and a company and some, you know, and a logo basically that I made. And I started sending unsolicited proposals to companies to do custom software development for them. And one of them called back and said, uh, it was funny because I answered my phone and they're like, wait a minute, isn't this a number of a Yale dorm room? Dorm room? And I said, this is my office. I didn't lie. I said, this is my office. And they said, okay, well, we like your bid. Uh, we'd love you to do this software project. Come down and talk to us. And they weren't surprised to see young people in software, but I won the bid. And I was like, uh-oh, now it's on. And I got no clue. So I walked around. I didn't have a car. I walked around to some high schools, to my campus and nearby colleges that I could walk to. And I just hung flyers on the wall that said programmers wanted. And I got a bunch of programmers called me and said, what do you need? I said, I need to hire some people to write code. Well, here's the good news, Pablo. Programmers in college and will work for pizza and beer, but businesses pay you real money. So my margins were really good. I would just <laughs> get the spec from the customer, go meet with all these developers. They would write software. I'd give, I'd get one of them to integrate the pieces together, give it back to a customer, pick up my check, and then go straight to the finance department of the university and say, here's another payment. Uh, and so I didn't know what I was doing, but I figured it out as I went. That's incredible. That is, I mean, you're truly extraordinary. That's very few people in the world, you know, pull something like that off. Um, how important would you say is attitude for entrepreneurs? So I 
believe I'm so glad you asked that because I think attitude is everything. And, you know, I had written down, in fact, I said this when you and I first met years ago, um, that your attitude determines your outcome. And, and if I, I may, I want to share a little story of how I learned that. Cool? Yeah, let's go for All it. Right. So <clears throat> when I was 10 years old, I was at my neighbor Mike's house. And all my buddies were in Mike's bedroom, staring at a poster on the wall that everybody was all excited about. And the poster was a picture of a red race car. It was a Ferrari. And I didn't even know what that was. Um, like I said, we grew up with no money. And, and I went home, actually on the real poster, there was a, a, a pretty girl in a bikini sitting on the hood of the Ferrari. But we were 10 and it was funny because we actually, I remember one of my buddies going, that is so gross. That girl's bare butt is touching that fine car. She needs to move. <laughs> so I go back to my mom. I go home. I said, Mom, I'm going to ask you a question. She said, what? And I said, why are all my friends so fascinated by this poster? My mom said, well, what's the poster, Jeff? I said, it's some kind of car. It's called a Ferrari. My mom said, oh, well, that explains the fascination. And I said, what? And she said, it's the unattainable dream. I said, wait, what? Aren't Ferraris real? My mom said, no, no, no. They're real but you'll just never have one. I said, I'm confused. She said, Jeff, that's like a $750,000 car that one I was looking at. And she's like, neither you nor anybody you know or will ever know will ever drive a car like that. That's why it's so fun to talk about. You know, people get excited about it. And I said, I still don't get it. I said, mom, does somebody drive that car? She said, well, yeah, they make a few of them every year. Someone drives that. And she said, just not you. And I said, well, why can't that be me someday? My mom said, well, it's never gonna be you or anybody you know. And I remember thinking, even though I was a kid, I was thinking, not with that attitude, it won't, right? Because if you've already accepted no, you're already done, you're already out of the race. And so I did an experiment, although I went to school the next day. And I told my buddies, I said, when I grow up, one day I'm gonna buy a Ferrari. Now, here's the thing, I don't, I'm not even a car guy. I don't even want the stupid car. I just don't want the world to tell me no. Why is the world telling me what I can and can't have? And, and so I told my friends, one day when I grow up, I'm going to get, drive a Ferrari. Everybody's like, ha, ha, ha. I was like, why is that funny? And they said, dude, you're never going to drive a Ferrari, and neither are any of the rest of us. And they said, you ever even seen one in the little town we live in? Of course not. And I remember thinking then, everybody laughed at it. And I started thinking this, and I'm, this is what I'm asking your viewers. Why do you let the rest of the world put a ceiling over you? Why are you letting anybody but you tell you what you're capable of doing? Why are you letting them cancel your dreams? So I went to the mall on my little bicycle that weekend and I bought the same poster and I brought it home and, and Pablo, I wrote on the back of it, a list of 17 things. They were fundamental things. We don't have time for that, but they were the things that I believed in that were true about the world, including things like that hard work really pays and that treating people well is the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, if I'm right, <clears throat> and I eventually over my life accomplished these 17 things, and I'm going to go buy that car just to prove that they're wrong, just to prove that it can be done. And so I just have to add one last funny thing, though. Um, <clears throat> when I was in high school, um, one day I was getting ready for football practice. My mom was giving me a ride. So I was in my closet and this poster fell out and I picked it up and I unrolled it and I was looking at it again and it was the same poster. Obviously I, I kept it all those years to keep track of whether or not I could achieve what I needed to achieve to ever own that car. And I'm looking at it and my mom comes up and she's like, I see you finally found that car again. And I'm looking and looking and I said, what car? And my mom said, oh, now that you're 18, you spotted the hot chick in the bikini. And we were <laughs> laughing about it. And I said, I guess maybe I never saw that before. And my mom said, son, can I tell you something? And I said, what? And she said, you ain't never getting one of those either. And we laughed so hard. My mom's like, you'll never have that either, son. I said, mom, can I ask you a question? And she's like, what? And I said, if I drove that car and she laughingly said, well, then maybe a girl like that might show up. And so we laughed about that, but that drove me to the understanding that most people cancel their own dreams and they let the rest of the world tell them what they're capable of. Your attitude and only your attitude is what determines your outcome. Right.
That's an incredible story, Jeff. And how old were you when you wrote that list on the back of the poster that you talked about? I was, when I did the list, I was 11. And, and uh, I spent my life sort of over the years as I grew and developed and challenged myself at when I would accomplish something, I would cross it off the back of that poster, off that list. Right. Do you think that there was something different about you? I mean, most kids at age 11 were not thinking about, you know, what they're going to achieve or what they're going to accomplish. You know, they're thinking about <clears throat> what girl they want to pick up at school or, <laughs> you know, how they can avoid doing homework, you know. So was there something different? Would you think you were born an entrepreneur? Yeah, you know, you know, it, it wasn't the entrepreneurial. It was the desire to do more than the minimum and the average. And I have to tell you, in my case, um, that came from a globe in my room, Pablo. Um, I grew up in a little town, um, you know, in Arizona, where nobody ever laughed at people I grew up with. And I'm not judging them at all. It's not right or wrong. No one wanted to go anywhere and do anything. And I had this globe that I would spin in my room and see this whole world of, of exotic and crazy and amazing places to explore that I was never going to see if I didn't do something above the average. So that it, it's similar to the car. I was thinking, I, I want to live an epic life, not an average life. And my epic life would include seeing the world. And if I'm going to see the world, no one's going to pay for it for me. I'm going to have to figure out how to create value in the world so I can put myself in a position to be able to go do the things I dreamed of, like seeing the world someday. So yeah, I think that's what was different, was that I let my imagination run, and I didn't tell my imagination that I wasn't going to follow it. I said, I'm actually going to give this a shot. I wasn't afraid to fail. I was afraid not to try. Right. That's incredible. Um, so we're going to go into our first commercial break here. We've got an interesting video from the SPECT app. Um, we're going to go ahead and play that. And up next, Jeff's going to talk about traveling the world while building an empire. In today's competitive job market, soft skills are more crucial than they've ever been. With the SPECT app, we're giving students the edge that they need to succeed. I think the foundational idea behind the SPECT app is outstanding. SPECT app can prepare students for higher education or their career in the future by preparing them and bringing awareness of the importance of soft skills and how soft skills are pretty much in everything that we do. Getting leadership roles and being involved in you know, clubs and organizations on campus really are what you know, helps you apply what you learn in school and helps prepare you for the workforce. A student that uses the SPECT app over the student who doesn't use the app will have a greater advantage. They'll be able to visually see their progress they've made throughout the years. Instead of sitting back there and pulling back into the gray matter of what did I do, what, trying to make things up, or trying to remember what they did, they have an opportunity to log those hours on an app. Any opportunity that we can give our students that will enhance them in their adult life is our job. I think that um, if a student is able to use that and to put in um, some of the activities that they're doing and seeing where that may be beneficial, but also identify opportunities for areas of growth. And through those activities, you're able to see what your soft skills might be. And from there, you're kind of able to see what you are best at working on and what your strengths are. Finding an opportunity and giving a platform to engage in opportunities that get experiences for individuals is absolutely what we need to be doing. As you're doing this and participating in these events, you end up having a, an aggregate of so many hours that you've actually put into a particular skill. So you can now actually say, I have 10,000 hours of communication skills. So that probably makes you a pretty good communicator. And that's what SPEC can do for you. Welcome back to the 161 Report. For those curious about learning more about the SPEC app, visit spec.app. It's a very exciting platform, and it's been awesome to see it grow over the past couple of years. Um, well, so we're going back into the show. We've got Jeff Hoffman here. In the, in the first 15 minutes, he shared an amazing story with us about the attitude and how important your attitude is as an entrepreneur. 
Now we're going to get into a little bit of how he molded his life to kind of live his dream of traveling the world. Jeff, can you talk about how you were so intentional about building up a business that allowed you to do what you truly wanted to do, what you were passionate about? Sure, uh, Pablo. And I think that that's an, an important lead in because while it's not a requirement that the business pursuits of your life match your passions, the simple truth is you'll put way more effort into building companies and products and solutions that are around things you actually care about. Um, and so <clears throat> for me, again, this also started with something that I read when I was in, I think, seventh grade. Um, we had to read a Mark Twain book. And I opened up this Mark Twain book. And on the inside cover, Mark Twain said, he said that travel is the fatal enemy of prejudice. And I remember going back to mom and saying, what does that mean? And I was up all night after she told me. She said that, that people develop hate and intolerance because of ignorance. She said, how are you judging people that you don't even know, right? It, give you an example, you know, some, there are, we've had periods of time in America, for example, that people think they, you know, quote, hate Muslim people and they don't even know one. Right? I'm using that just as a random example, but I got it back then. And so I sat up in bed all that night thinking to myself, if I want to become like the, you know, the man I want to be someday, the person I want to be someday, I'm going to have to go see the world. I'm going to have to understand the world by living in it. And I was like, so I made this goal, Pablo. I said, for me to live an epic life, I was thinking, what would make my life epic? And I want, I want everybody, you know, watching us now to ask the same question. What would make an epic life for you? And mine was, I wrote it down. Mine was, if before I die throughout my life, I get I can visit 50 countries. That's the goal I gave myself. I'm going to visit 50 countries before I die. And that'll be an epic life that I'll have lived my dream. And so that's why, you know, probably you're a little less surprised now that I was involved in companies like Priceline, um, which were all about travel, because travel is the thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to see the world, but here's, an, here's sort of an important note um, <clears throat> about being intentional, like you said. Um, the, uh, well, well, let me tell you this. When I, when I got out of school, I talked earlier about how I funded my college, but when I got out, I had a computer science degree writing code. And the world you know, tells you, go get a good job at a good company and a good salary. My parents did, my mom, everybody. Go get a good job. You have an engineering degree, you can get a good job and a good salary, a good company. So I did. When I got out of school, I kind of folded to the pressure uh, that especially for everybody that's a college student, your parents are telling you, pick a, pick a skill, a major, a degree that you can get a good job in and get paid. And so I did that. And I had a good job at a good company and a good salary. But you know what I didn't have, Pablo? I did not have a good life. I actually hated my job. Every day I went in there and on my little cute engineering cubicle. And again, we're not talking right or wrong if that's what you want to do, but that wasn't my DNA. I would sit there and I'd gaze out the window at the somewhere out there were the 50 countries that I was not visiting. And I remember saying to myself, man, I'm never going to see the world. And then one day something happened. <clears throat> I was sitting in my cubicle and I visited a total of zero of the 50 countries I want to visit. And uh, I, my, I got in the elevator to go to lunch. I hated my job, so I always went out for lunch. And I'm leaving, and one of my buddies is in the elevator. And I was like, Brian, what are you doing here? And he's like, dude, I work here. What are you doing here? And I was like, I work here. And I was like, how is it one of my friends works in the same company, and I've never even run into you? I said, where do you work? He said, I'm in marketing. I got a marketing degree. I work in marketing on the sixth floor. And I said, well, that explains it. I'm in engineering, and engineering's on four. I come in every day. <clears throat> I go to the fourth floor and go to work. That's why i never seen you. I never go to six. So I go home that day and I'm brushing my teeth and I'm thinking, and by the way, I know I've shared this with you before, Pablo, but I would encourage everybody listening to write at least your next dream. I put mine on a white index card and I stick it on the bathroom mirror. That's that. And so on my bathroom mirror, I had written, visit 50 countries before I die. Why is it on the bathroom mirror? Because at the end of every day, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is brush my teeth. So every day at the end of the day, I look at that little card and I say, Jeff, 
did you do anything to get any closer to the life that you dreamed about, an epic life? Every morning when I get up, I brush my teeth to start the day and I say, Jeff, have, are you, what are you going to do today to get any closer to living your epic life? So I go home that night and I'm brushing my teeth. I look at that little card. It says, visit 50 countries before I die. And I got to tell you, Pablo, my toothbrush just fell out of my mouth. And I said, wow. I said, how am I going to visit 50 countries when I've never even visited the sixth floor? And I remember <laughs> thinking to myself, the only foreign country I've ever been to is the accounting department on five. One time I got <laughs> off the elevator on the wrong floor and I was like, whoa, where am I? And it was the accounting department. That's the most exotic place I've ever been in my life. So <clears throat> that is actually the event that caused me to quit my job and say, I have got to do something that enables my dream. So my very first startup actually was in the travel industry because my goal was to create. I did not have any job. When I tell my friends, I'm going to go see the world. They're like, yeah, dude, who's going to pay you to see the world? And so one day I said, no one. So what if I created a job where I got paid to do the thing I want to do? Why don't you create a job where your job is to go see the world? That's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. It's the opportunity to design the life you want. So my very first startup was actually a travel company. So I wound up finding a way to create a job that let me live my dream. Right. And can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> how that how that happened, how that company came about, how you came up with the idea and how you sure. built the company? Sure. So I quit. I told you guys the story. I quit the engineering job. Now everyone's mad at me and I'm broke. I'm hungry. My mom's yelling at me. My son's an idiot. He quit his good engineering job at a good company. Um, <clears throat> I bought an airline ticket um, to go with, and I didn't have much money then, being unemployed, to go speak to my mentor. When I got to the airport that day, it was really crowded on a Friday afternoon. The airport was jammed. And back then, you had to uh, go up to a ticket agent at a counter to get a boarding pass. They would look at your ID, print your boarding pass. I stood in line for an hour. By the time I got up there, I realized I missed my flight. When I finally got there, I gave her my idea. The woman print ID. The woman printed my boarding pass. And, and I said, you know, I missed the flight. And she's like, next. And I was like, ma'am, this is ridiculous. I stood in line for an hour. And all you did was hit print. A boarding card is just a, a boarding pass is a piece of paper. And she's like, next. And I'm like, really frustrated. And I stopped, but here's a realization that, that I want you all to find. If you are thinking in your, and if you have both of these things in your mind, what is the, your epic life? What is the thing you're dreaming of? What is it you're trying to do? Mine was find a way to get paid to see the world, see the world. And then on the other side, you have to find a problem to solve in that space that you want to be in. And so I was thinking, wait a minute, this is my moment. What if I could solve a problem for airlines around the world? Then they would hire me to come to their country to deliver my product. So I realized this was my moment to design my future. So I went home and on that Friday, I started my first company out of school and my first product. So today, if, you, if any of you viewing have gone to an airport and checked yourself in at a check-in kiosk, that was my first invention. I went home and said, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to design a kiosk that lets people check themselves in at airports. And I got to tell you, Pablo, sometime later, my phone's ringing and it's like KLM, Royal Dutch Airline. Mr. Hoffman, sir. And I'm like, yes. They're like, any way we could get you to come to the Netherlands, to Holland? I said, what for? They said, we want to see this kiosk you design. It sounds like a really cool way to make airports more efficient with check-in kiosks. So I'm on a plane. I'm off to, I'm off to the Netherlands. And then the phone rings next and it's Lufthansa, German Airlines, and could you come here? And, you know, pretty soon it is, I'm getting to go see the world. But the crazy part, Pablo, is I'm getting paid to see the world because everybody wants to buy a kiosk for their airport and their airline. So I wound up creating a job where it was my actual job to fly to a different country every week to sell my product. That is the beauty of entrepreneurship is be intentional about designing a company it will put you in the position to go do whatever it is you want to do with your life so that you wind up having an epic life and getting paid to do it at the same time. That is some great practical advice right there, Jeff. Um, I'm just out of curiosity, what do you think are some of the most important traits for an entrepreneur to have? 
Well, all right, let me, let me before I do that, that's a, an absolutely critical question, but let me tell you this, the formula for getting where you wanna go, I think the formula for having an epic life is that you need to become valuable to the people in the world that you wanna be around. If you wanna be in fashion, uh, then you need to be valuable to the fashion industry. If you wanna be in travel, you need to be valuable to airlines. You know, we can talk later if, you, if we have time about how I got into the music industry. You become valuable. So the question you need to ask is, who are the people you wanna be around that would make your life epic? And the way you become valuable to them is by solving a problem that they have so that they gotta call you. You need to become the go-to girl or the go-to guy for the people you want to call you. I wanted to be the go-to guy for airlines to solve their problem. What problem you can you solve for the people that you want to call you so that you're their go-to person? That is the simple formula uh, of, of leading an epic life as an entrepreneur. And so I wanted to share that summary before we get into what are the traits that make you a good entrepreneur. Right, absolutely. Um, so maybe you can share those, some of those traits with us very briefly, and then we'll go into our second commercial break. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think the first and most important trait you can develop is listening skills. Entrepreneurs, we're always excited about our idea and passionate, which is great. And you want to tell everybody what you're doing, but you learn 10 times more or whatever when your mouth is closed than you do when it's open. So I learned over time, the better my listening skills became, uh, the faster my knowledge grew and the faster I was able to navigate the world. Learn to listen. Part of that, a, a partner, a complimentary skill set to that is learn how to ask good questions. The information you collect is directly related to the question that you ask. So if you're not asking the right question, you're not getting the right information. Develop your questioning skills and work hard on that. And when you finish your conversation, say, what did I learn? And what, and how is that related to the questions that I asked in that conversation? So ask the right questions then listen for the answers. One more, I'll just throw a quick one in here as well, is your networking skills. I know you've all been told this over and over again, but the truth is the power of your network is, uh, is, is, the, is the limiting or, you know, or opening factor for you. Somebody uh, said to me today, um, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I totally believe that. Um, the, the people you surround yourself with have everything to do with where you wind up going in life. So Pablo, there's just a, a quick handful of some of the traits you need to really focus on to be good at entrepreneuring. Absolutely, that's some great advice right there. Those are, those are some amazing uh, characteristic traits that every entrepreneur needs and should develop in order to succeed. Um, we're gonna go into our second commercial break here. So we've got an amazing video about the city of Gainesville put together by Rutex. This is Gainesville a place where we strive to make each day better than the last one. We believe in innovation, a home of the community. It's where people laugh and cheer. Also, this is the home of the Florida Gators. We believe in inspiring our youth. We embrace everyone's culture. Right now, our business is doing extremely well.
Welcome back to the 161 Report. We got Jeff Hoffman here. If you enjoyed that video about the city of Gainesville by Rutex, visit rutexcreative.com to learn more about getting content for your business. So going back to the interview, Jeff has shared some very incredible stories with us and he's shared some of the top characteristic traits of successful entrepreneurs. Now, I wanna get more into this, this point, this comment that Jeff made in the first half about it, you wanna think about how you're designing your life and then you wanna create something to solve the problem of those people you wanna align yourself with. And so one of the things that I think is very, very interesting about Jeff is uh, you built some amazing companies, but then you somehow got into the music industry and won a Grammy and you got into producing a film. Can you talk about how that came about and how you're able to do that? Sure. So. I think one of the most important things for, for anybody listening, again, is uh, <clears throat> to realize that despite what your parents tell you when you're graduating college, you do not have to decide what you're doing with the rest of your life. By the way, that was not popular when I told my parents that. People ask me now, what do you do? What, what's your plan for your life? I always tell them, I can tell you what I'm going to do for the next few years and then ask me again three years from now. Mine tends to go in three or four year chunks of your life. And when people say to you, you're an engineer or you're account an accountant, you're not an engineer, you're not an accountant, you're a person that learned those skills. So by the same token, why can't you learn something else? Why do you have to do one thing where people say to you that you're, and it, well, my example was, I've always been fascinated music. I love, love, love music. Um, and I've always been fascinated by it. And the question I brought up earlier that I want you to all to keep asking yourselves is, what would make your life epic? And one day I was at a concert with friends. And when I was at this concert, um, a guy came out uh, at the beginning, came on stage, 30,000 people there. And he's like, are you people ready to rock? And the place erupted and everyone's screaming. And, and my, I turned to my buddy and I go like, who's that guy? And they're like, he's the producer. This is his concert. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to be that guy. And they turned to me and they said, Jeff, you're an engineer and you're not a music guy, you don't know anything about the business. And I remember thinking the same way I learned engineering, why can't I learn music? So what I did was I started studying every night, every piece of information I could consume on music. I went online, I Googled everything, I read stories. I decided that I wanted to produce a concert like that guy. Um, and so when I told my friends I'm gonna produce concerts, everybody laughed at me, you're a software engineer, right? You're not a music person. But here's the formula, guys. While you're studying the industry, by the way, not only did you read everything you could, but here's an example. In my searching, I discovered that the concert industry has its own magazine. Every industry has their own associations and stuff. The magazine was called Polestar. It's the magazine of the concert industry. I'd never heard of that. So I spent the $12.95 and bought it. And in there were stories by concert producers. And at the end of it was their email address. So now I'm just emailing people in the music business. 99 out of 100 won't answer, but the 100th will, and he'll introduce you to people that he knows, and suddenly you got a little bit of an in. And so here's the formula. Remember, we talked about entrepreneurship is about problem solving. Pick the industry that you really want to get in, the people you want to be around. I wanted to be around music. I wanted to produce a concert and start my own music company. So make a list of all the problems that industry has to solve. So I went to my whiteboard. And I wrote down, to produce a concert, here's all the things you have to do, the problems to solve. Somebody has to sing the song, that's not me. Somebody has to write the song, that's not me. Somebody has to dance on stage, that's definitely not me. Okay, but as I started writing them, somebody has to put together financing for a, for a concert. Uh, Beyonce doesn't pay herself, somebody hires her. I was like, wait a minute, I know how to do finance deals. And as I was listing things later, Somebody has to promote and market the concert to fill up the seat. Someone has to come up with clever marketing promotional ideas. I was like, I can do that. And so <clears throat> what you do is you list all the problems that, that industry has to solve, cross off all the ones you can't do. If you've crossed everything off, move on. You're not going to be in the music industry. But that's not what happens. What happened was I found out that, and then I started talking to people in the music business and talking to smaller, but artists I could get to and saying, you're in the music business, what's the biggest problem you have? And they said, you don't make any money selling music anymore. You make money performing live. And I said, 
well, why can't you perform live? And they said, because we're all musicians and we don't know how to put business deals together. I said, that's a problem. And I said, what would make me valuable to you? And they said, dude, if you could put a deal together for the financing to, to the business deal to, to produce a concert, then we'd have somewhere to sing and get paid. We'd love you. And then I found out that the other problem is, even if these musicians came up with some funding to produce a concert, they're not marketers. They don't know how to promote it. And so those were two problems I could solve. So I started a music company where our specialty was, we will put together the deal, the financing and everything, we'll put together a concert, and at the end, we'll do all the marketing and promotion, and we'll sell the thing out. And so all of a sudden, I, I'll just cut Pablo to a day, I was walking out on stage, I was producing a concert with Elton John, and I was walking out on stage, and Elton's backstage, he's like, Jeff, go introduce me, let's go. So I go out on stage, and it's this out-of-body experience. I hear this voice saying, is everybody ready to rock? And I hear 30,000 screaming people. All my friends are in that audience somewhere. And I remember thinking, whoa, man, who said that? And then I had this like moment. I was like, well, that was me. I said, I'm actually the dude on stage now saying who's ready to rock. And from sitting in the seats with 30,000 people to standing up there being the producer, the difference was that I made a list of all the problems the industry had. I asked people, what do you need help with? I got skilled in the thing they needed help with, and then they started calling me. <clears throat> they became, you become the go-to person. I'll, I'll tell you a couple quick last things about that. Um, you know, I, I spent this weekend uh, <clears throat> with somebody, you know, that I looked up to, a big fan that's now become a close, close friend, which is Pitbull. And the reason that Pitbull and I met in the first place and now we're doing uh, business together and philanthropy work together is because he had a business question that all of his music industry friends are music people. And when he said, who should I ask? People in the industry said, you gotta call Jeff. He's the go-to guy, he knows this stuff. You need to become the go-to guy or girl for the people you wanna be around. I knew how to do the business side of the music biz. And so the funny ending was when we produced that jazz album and we won a Grammy, I was at the red carpet in the Grammys, and I mean, it was nuts, right? I'm a software engineer, we just won a Grammy, and all the paparazzi people were yelling, how do you feel right now? And I remember, I stood there, I don't even know what to say, and I said, this is the dream of every software engineer everywhere. And it's like dead silent crickets on the red carpet, and they're like, what? And I was like, "Never mind." The little guy with the headset's like, uh, dude, can you just stop talking? You're killing the vibe here. But the point was that, I had a dream, not of winning a Grammy by a long shot, but of being an industry I wanted to be in. And so I used the formula I told you. I figured out what problems I have. I found some I could solve. And I spread the word that I can fix your problem. And suddenly you're in and everybody's calling you. That's the formula for, for getting where you want to go in life is by being valuable to those people. That's how we launched the music company. Later, Pablo, we launched a tour company. And you know, I found myself one day on tour at the time with NSYNC and Justin Timberlake. We did tours with them, with Britney Spears, uh, with Backstreet, it was the pop era. But all of a sudden I'm literally on the tour bus and my friends are like, what the hell are you doing on the tour bus with Justin Timberlake? And my answer was, I found a way to become valuable to these people in the tour business and now suddenly you're in the game. Jeff, you have this formula and it's, uh... It almost sounds like it just you can apply it to just any industry or anything that you want to do in life. And for me, I feel like, you know, okay, yeah, this formula could work, but entrepreneurship is still really hard. So it's almost as if you had like two gurus behind your shoulders just like walking you through the whole process or something like that. You know, can I tell you, first of all, for that part, mentorship is everything. And I just started boldly because for just like you said, I do believe that you can kind of apply this model to everything. Uh, that's how I wound up starting a, mu a movie company. I said, hell, I'm just gonna go produce a film. All my friends go, there go crazy Jeff, the software engineer thinking he knows the movie business. I said, I don't, but I'm gonna learn a piece of it and I'm gonna become valuable enough to get into it. Um, but I didn't have those gurus and you have to find mentors and mentors aren't gonna call you. They're busy people. And so I just relentlessly pursued mentors by cold calling and getting a lot of rejection until someone said, I can't believe you have the nerve to think I'm gonna give you my time for free to help some young person that has no idea what he's doing. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, 
you got pretty big ones there, pal. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you know what you remind me of? And I was already leaving his office because he said, I can't believe you have the nerve to ask me to mentor you. And I was already leaving and he said, you know what you remind me of? And I said, no, what? He said, me, when I was your age, I wanna help you. So you gotta find mentors. So you do have guidance. And the way to find a mentor is not because they're in the industry you're in, you find a mentor by picking someone who you want to be like when you grow up. The guy that I first went to was a guy who said, I want to be like him one day. Find someone you want to be like when you grow up and then boldly hunt them down. And you'll get a lot of no's, but eventually you will get mentorship from somebody that says, I like your style, you remind me of me, whatever it is, and they'll help you. So Pablo, without those mentors, I, I never would have stumbled my way into that. And by the way, you fail a lot along the way. We're talking about the successes, but I've had some really stupid ideas that crashed and burned and failed miserably. The difference is I just shook it off and got over it and kept going. Failure is just part of the game. It's not fun, but it's part of it, a, a, a part of that process along the way. So we did apply this model uh, all the way along. When, we, when I studied the film business, we went out to make a, and by the way, remember, don't be afraid of failing. Be afraid of not trying. If I tried to make a movie and it failed miserably, which the odds were it was going to, I can live with that. What I don't want to do is spend my whole life wondering if I could have succeeded at something. Just try. Get it, get, if you're going to fail, get it over with already. Get it out of your system. So the very first movie we ever made, we never made a movie. But I studied the industry up all night, every night, calling people, emailing people, learning the movie biz. And we, we made our own horror flick. We wrote it, shot it, directed it, produced it. All of us are even in it. Uh, I financed it, and we made a little movie at the time called Cabin Fever. It's on Hulu. It's on Netflix. Actually, it's doing really well right now because it's about a flesh-eating virus. So everybody's watching virus movies during COVID, and our movie is doing really well right now. But we made a little movie ourselves, and we wound up, because I told you guys I know how to market and promote stuff, we wound up getting it in theaters all over the world. And we made this little movie for just over a million bucks, and worldwide it grossed over a hundred million dollars because we were good at the part that we knew how to do. The model applies to anything, but you need help. You got to get mentors. Absolutely. We're going to go into our third commercial break here, and we've got a special message for you all from Synapse Florida. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Prager. Hi, I'm Allie. Hi, I'm Kylie. Hi, I'm Monica Angel. Hi, I'm Brian Kornfeld from Synapse Florida, and I'm amped to announce the next evolution in supporting Florida's innovation communities. We're living in a time of unprecedented challenges and opportunity, but crisis fuels innovation, and Florida's talent is stepping up to meet the moment. Innovation requires collaboration, and Synapse exists to foster meaningful connections. We're here to help you find what you need and share what you have. What better way to foster this camaraderie than through a digital statewide meeting of the minds? A rally. A convergence. Synapse Converge is an interactive digital conference unlike any other you'll be invited to this year. It's for innovators, created by innovators. This is not your typical Zoom meeting. This is a time for hands-on learning, meaningful connections, intentional engagement, access to the experts you need in order to succeed through live chats and Q&A. And for those of us still working at home with our colleagues, kids or dogs, if they pop in, you've got all the sessions and they'll be recorded and available to watch anytime during the conference. So mark your calendar. No, really. Click below to register. June 9th, 10th, and 11th. We'll see you there. Welcome back to the 161 Report. We're here with Jeff Hoffman. Um, for those tuning in who saw that commercial, uh, Synapse Florida has this amazing event happening, Converge. It's, an, it's gonna be a great event. I'm very excited to be participating myself. If you're interested in learning more or getting tickets, go to converge.synapsefl.com. Um, so getting back to our interview, Jeff Hoffman just gave us the formula that you need in order to succeed in doing whatever it is you wanna do in life. And it was fascinating for me to learn about this. 
um, because he applied it not just in business, but in the music industry to win a Grammy and in the film industry to create a, a movie that's now on Netflix and Hulu. So, Jeff, um, I know you talked about how you did have failures and you just kind of got back up and brushed it off. I was wondering if you could kind of dive into one of those, maybe one of your biggest failures, if you're open to it, you don't have to. And sure. tell us about it. Happy to share that. By the way, I've got to say something too from coming out of your commercial break. I'm a huge fan of Synapse Florida. The Synapse team are phenomenal people. I love what they do. So I'm so glad, Pablo, that you're going to be participating with them. Uh, I love those folks. Great organization. Um, failure happens. If you if you never fail, it's because you're not pushing the envelope. I did this event one time. It was with a lot of kids, but it was me and Tony Hawk, the, the skateboard guy. And Tony was the first person in the world to ever uh, do a, 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 to nail, to land a 720 in a competition. And we were up there doing this like fireside chat. And I said, so the first time you got on the board, you just nailed the 720, right? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, you got on the board, said, I'm going to do a 720. And you, you, you did the trick. He said, Jeff, I broke like nine bones and had 11 hospital visits from the day I decided until the day I actually stuck that thing. I said, wait, what, you failed? And he said a million times along the way. If you, he said, but if I wasn't willing to try that and risk that, I would have never been able to uh, ever do that trick and ever be the first person in history to do it. That's how life goes. If you're not failing, it's because you're not pushing the envelope. You're not trying hard enough. Failure comes with trying. And <clears throat> so I've had some ideas. I I'll tell you one in particular early on had this crazy idea that instead of driving to a mall, why don't you buy that pair of shoes on this really cool new thing called the internet? So um, some of you might be too young to have ever lived without the internet, uh, but when the internet was born, which was 20 something years ago, when it, when it became commercial, um, early on I went, uh, I got this idea to start this company uh, to shop online and so I was so excited about it. We got a little investor money. We spent a lot of time. We built this technology. We launched this company and then we told people we went live. And we said, instead of driving to the mall to buy those shoes, go on your computer that's already in your house, click on these pictures of shoes and buy them right here and they'll be shipped to you. You don't have to go anymore. You can look at shoes all over the world instead of just one, a couple of stores you can walk to. We went live, we were all excited. We crowded around the computer screen Crickets, chirping, silence. No one bought Jack. And the reason they didn't buy anything <clears throat> was because people were like the inter what? And we're like, it's the web. And they're like the web of what? And we're like HTTP, WWW. And they're like, dude, we speak English. We don't even know what you're talking about. And then when I would show people, they would say, so they come over and get the money. Do I have to take money somewhere? I'm like, no, in your credit card. And they're like, do I swipe it on the screen? We're like, no. You type your credit card number into the computer and they're like, so, so you and your friends can go to the mall. And I was like, oh my God, let's start this over. And people were like, you want me to type my credit card number into your computer? And I was, nobody bought anything. The world was not ready to shop online. We were too early. We failed miserably and we had to close the whole company down. All the money we spent was gone. No one bought anything. So we were just too early in the business, but it was a failure. I thought I had a good idea and I didn't pay attention. I didn't go out and research the world well enough to see where the world was. So the lesson I want to share with you guys is now, when I was doing this TV show with these, these CEOs and the, the reporter said, the host said, uh, when you guys as CEOs get a good idea, what's the first thing you do? And all the CEOs said, I get my team and we go into the conference room, we go to the whiteboard. And I said, I get my car keys and I go to the parking lot. And everyone's like, what are you talking about, Jeff? <clears throat> and this is the lesson I learned. When I have a good idea, I no longer start working on it. I leave and I go immediately to find the people that I think are going to buy my product. And I say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing. If I did this, would you even buy it anyway? Talk to me now. In, in, in conventional entrepreneurship training, they teach you to build an MVP and then collect feedback. By the time you get to an MVP, if you don't already know if people like it, you already missed the boat. The MVP is way too late. You should be, the second you have an idea, 
you should immediately leave, go find those people, tell them what you're thinking of doing and see if the customers, if I had gone out to people and say, I'm going to build this thing where you can buy shoes on your computer, they would have said, I don't know what you're talking about and I won't do it and I never would have launched the company. So we had bad ideas that failed um, because we didn't go out and talk to customers at the beginning. And by the way, let me say this about failure, Pablo. Um, it's a DNA thing. There is a saying that says, being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff and trying to build an airplane on your way down. If that scares the crap out of you, go do something else. You're not an entrepreneur. If it's the thrill of the unknown, I've spent my whole life throwing myself off cliffs, looking down and saying, oh, this is going to be a good one. Sometimes I wound up, you know, on the bottom in a pile of broken bones, figuratively speaking, unlike uh, Tony Hawk, who literally did that. Um, <laughs> if you're afraid of the fact that you don't know any of the answers, this isn't for you. But if you're thrilled by the fact that you get to figure it out as you go, entrepreneurship is for you. So that means you are going to fail. And failure, the entrepreneur of DNA, the, the DNA of entrepreneurs is that you shake it off. You know what I used to tell my team? I would say, if we fail on Friday, I would say, guys, you can spend you can spend all day Saturday crying. You can spend all day Sunday doing whatever makes you feel good. Go out and climb a mountain, uh, go have a beer, do whatever it works for you. But shake it off by Sunday night and get back here Monday because we're going to try something new. Entrepreneurs, get over it. Shake it off, move on, and start something new. You'll take a lot of abuse along the way because people will make fun of you. Oh, do you Jeff thinks he's so smart. Your idea was stupid. As you're right, people, I'm an idiot. My idea was stupid. Failed many times, took the abuse, shook it off. And by the way, those people that told you how stupid you are, those are the people that later show up, um, I'm going to say a really bad thing, asking you for a ride in your Ferrari. <laughs> um, uh, and that's not the kind of person I am, but I'm just saying the loop comes back that all the people that don't believe in you forget that they didn't believe in you along the way. So just get over it, shake it off and start again. You will fail. It wasn't fun, but I learned from every failure. So just get back up quickly, brush it off, yep. and keep moving forward. Great Figure out advice. what you did wrong, learn something from it, and start another one. Right. Okay, so um, I really want to take these last 10 minutes that we have together and talk about uh, making a global impact and how you're doing that through some of the organizations <clears throat> that you've helped start that you're currently on the board of as well. Um, because the 161 group, you know, we are a very similar structure and we are trying to make a global impact as well. Of course, much smaller right now. We're just starting out. Um, so can you talk a little bit about maybe the Global Entrepreneurship Network, the Unreasonable Group, your involvement with these, and how you guys are making a global impact? Yeah, I sure will. But Pablo, I'm going to say this again uh, uh, for a 161. 161 makes a global impact by doing this one community at a time, right? The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So uh, you guys are on your way to doing that uh, one community time. That's how it gets done. So I've been part of, I made a commitment. Um, on, you know, somebody said to me one day, man, your life's been like this fun adventure. Well, everything isn't fun. But I remember thinking, if my life has been an adventure in some ways, then that adventure was brought to you by entrepreneurship. The same way you have your commercial breaks, I had a sponsor. My sponsor was entrepreneurship. It's because of my life choice to be an entrepreneur that I was able to live some cool things in my life that I wouldn't have had I not chosen this path. So I decided to pay that debt back by making a commitment to teaching as many people as I could how to be entrepreneurs. So now the rest of my life, I've committed to not running businesses to make money anymore, but to teaching entrepreneurship to as many people as I can, which is why I'm here with you guys today. And so in that vein, I'm part of a couple, of, let me talk about two organizations I'm really proud of. Um, one of them is called the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which I'm the chairman of. Global Entrepreneurship Network builds entrepreneurial ecosystems. We are now, we have people on the ground in 180 countries. We've been doing this for a lot of years now. We provide all the support at the Global Entrepreneurship Network or GEN that entrepreneurs need to build their companies from, from helping create business angel and investor networks to working with universities um, to add more content for entrepreneurial degrees and training to working with governments to make laws and, and, and tax breaks and everything that helps spur entrepreneurship 
to providing more entrepreneurial training and classes and community and mentor networks. So um, at the Global Entrepreneurship Network, we build all over the world, all the support tools you need to help you with your startup. I've been part of that. By the way, we also run the Global Entrepreneurship Week that, that I know, uh, you know, a lot of the universities, uh, you know, like in Gainesville, um, actually hold events every Global Entrepreneurship Week, every November. That's our event as well. I'm also proud to say that, likewise, I was a founding board member of an organization called the Unreasonable Group. And Unreasonable is named after a famous quote by the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw. And George Bernard Shaw said that a reasonable person adapts to the world around them. An unreasonable person expects that the whole world is going to adapt to them. Therefore, all progress in the world is dependent upon unreasonable people. So what we did was we said, let's go find all the people crazy enough to think they can change the world and help them do it. And so the unreasonable group works with entrepreneurs all over the world to help startups and scale ups. We help the, the entrepreneurs that we believe are going to change the world. We help you do it. We do boot camps to tell you how to launch a company. We do boot camps to help you scale your company once it's launched. Um, we provide access to funding and investors. We provide a mentors network that wraps around entrepreneurs for the whole rest of your life so that you have access to a powerful network of people that can help you turn your ideas into profitable companies. So those are two of the ways I spend my time traveling all over the world, um, meeting with entrepreneurs. Now that we can't travel, we do this virtually. So for example, uh, we're hosting, and some of you might want to join us, we're hosting at Global Entrepreneurship Network, we're hosting the Entrepreneurship World Cup, EWC. Um, and you can Google it under EWC 2020, um, where we give out literally millions of dollars in cash to startups in a global entrepreneurship startup pitch competition for ideas and for company launches. And the other day I did a live session like this, but it was an interactive Q&A that we had entrepreneurs from over 100 countries all over the world online live with me doing Q&A. So I spend my time now, uh, Pablo, teaching entrepreneurs around the world how to launch their businesses. And what advice would you give to an organization like the 161 Group who's trying to make an impact? You know, how do we get the attention of a successful, accomplished entrepreneurs such as yourself? How do we get an advisor like that? How can we partner up with organizations such as the Global or, uh, Entrepreneurship Organization? Or All right, Network? so the, the, uh, the most, well, uh, ironically, one of my answers is the one we just gave all of your viewers, which is, to have something that those people want, to provide value. So a highlight for all of you, but for you as well, Pablo at 161, um, <clears throat> is to drive hard on the value that 161 and the 161 report brings to entrepreneurs so that people in the entrepreneurial support community will say, man, your content is fantastic. It's something we need. How do we partner with you to do that? So make sure that you don't ever assume people understand your value. Lay it out for them constantly reiterate, this is why you need us, this is what our value is, and never expect people to figure that out on their own. A lot of times people say, I don't get why people don't see the value of my product. And the answer is, well, did you tell them explicitly? No, it should be obvious, it's not. Make sure people understand the value of what you do. And the other part of my answer, uh, Pablo, is impact, is show success stories. When you have an entrepreneur that stands up and says, the content, the value I got from 161 changed my life in the following way. That social proof illustrates that, that the value you say you bring, you really are bringing. Show the impact of it and, and people will start to really take notice. Absolutely. Um, is this something that you would suggest people start one community at a time? Or is this something that you, for example, Global Entrepreneurship Network, um, when you launched that, you guys started with a uh, pretty much global from the start, correct? No, we didn't. So you are correct. All of these entities I'm talking about, uh, the unreasonable companies, you know, also do business in over 200 countries. All of these things, in fact, even if you go back to a company like Priceline, which is also which is Booking.com, same company, it does business in 190 countries. Every one of these entities started in a one platform, started in one community to prove that it could work then expanded to a, 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 sub, a, a bigger set of communities to prove you could do it regionally, then expanded to a national rollout to prove you could do it in one country, then expanded to a regional 
roll out to woo if you could do it on that continent, then you go global. So uh, uh, one community time is correct, but when you prove yourself in a number of communities, then you do a region. And from a region, you know, you can do a country and then whatever it is. So yeah, the one community at time model works. The difference in today's world is you just get global way faster than you used to, but don't try to be global at, at, at once because it's too hard to support a global infrastructure when you're small, grow into it. Grow into it, okay. Um, well, this has been so helpful and so valuable and I really hope that our viewers will agree with me and I think they will. Um, Jeff, we're gonna wrap up. You've been super generous with your time, so thank you for that. Um, is there any last minute remarks, advice, uh, tips, any, anything you would like to leave our viewers and listeners with? Yeah, I'm just gonna go back to what I started with. I'm gonna close with our opening, which is I'm gonna tell you again, your attitude determines your outcome. Quit listening to everybody around you that thinks your ideas are crazy and your dreams, dreams are too big. Uh, they'll still be there when you get back because they've already given up on their ideas and dreams. Don't let the world put a ceiling over you. Uh, you know, throw yourself off a cliff, even without an airplane or a parachute, and you will find that even in the worst case, man, at least you're out there living while everyone else is safely in their cubicle, afraid to try. Take risks. I think that, Pablo, is my closing comment. Thank you guys for spending this time with us. Thank you so much. This is the 161 Report. Thank you for tuning in. And for those of us um, still here watching, um, so next week we've got a very interesting session. Um, it's about uh, the J.C. Newman Cigar Company that's been in business 125 years. And they're celebrating their 125th anniversary actually this month, May. Um, so we're gonna have Bobby Newman, he's a third generation owner, talking about building a company that can last. So hope to see you guys there for that session. Uh, thank you for tuning in and thank you to Bamboo Strategic Media for making this possible.